Hello? Yes. Uh, this is Justin Hi, here. Justin. Yes. Hi, this is Dr. Taylor. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. Um, so I spent some time looking at your results, and we have about 50 minutes or so to discuss whatever you want to discuss surrounding these results in healthcare and whatnot. And, of course, I have to tell you that I'm not your primary care doctor, so any of the plan that we talk about you want to discuss with your primary care doctor because that person will be able to integrate all of the aspects of wellness and not just the labs or what we talk about. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. All right. So um, you, I saw, I see you're 30. I'm just going to confirm the information. 32 years old. Looks like you are a pretty muscular guy um, at 100, 200, about 200 pounds, 6'1". Family history of looks like the typical stuff, a um, little bit of hypertension, some diabetes and grandparents, and some siblings with some uh, heart disease and and uh, blood pressure issues and diabetes and all the normal stuff. Does that sound right? Yes. Okay. And do you have any specific um, health care concerns, or did you just kind of get the labs and participate for just general wellness? Like, what's going on? Yeah, it was just for general wellness, actually. Um, I just wanted to know where I stood. And so I know, cause I felt like, um, a lot of the, like diet specifically, it's kind of like, I'm guessing. Uh, mm -hmm. so I wanted to know if, if I'm deficient in any area so I can start correcting that. Okay. And what kind of diet do you eat? Like mostly meats or mostly veggie, vegan, do you have a special diet? No, it's, uh, it's kind of all over the place, but I don't, I don't. I do stray away from a lot of fried foods, fast foods, and stuff like that. So I do pretty good in that regard. But um, I don't have, like, a specific diet that has a term for it anyway. Okay. And you don't have any medical problems listed, so I'm assuming that that means you don't have any? Or did you forget to put them down? No, yeah, no problems. Good. No medications. Okay. All right. Let's see if there's... Well, over, overall, your labs look pretty good. I mean, just in general, you know, uh, we can spend a little bit more time talking about the red ones. I'm looking at the, what is it, the table view or the summary view? Um, it looks like the table view, but I can do either. It doesn't matter. But, um, you know, most of them are green. I always want to explain to patients that when you get labs done, it's just numbers, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and it, it's kind of easier to understand if I say like with weight and if you, if you say the ideal body weight is, you know, let's say 150 pounds. Now for your theoretically based on population, if I said your ideal weight was 150 pounds, you know that if you were only 150 pounds, you would look sick, you wouldn't feel well, you wouldn't be strong. So those are just numbers and they don't apply to you necessarily. So labs are the same way. The way they come up with what's normal and what's not normal is they take a cross-section of the population, and most people fall under the bell curve. And when you get to the 95th percentile, they say that's high, over, over 95th percentile is high, just arbitrarily kind of, and below the 5th percentile is low. And so you could have been born with a number that's in the 96th percentile, which is still technically normal for lots of people. It's just that arbitrary cutoff of what, quote, is normal, you fell out of it. And the reason why I mention that is because I wouldn't want you or anybody to spend an excessive amount of time worrying about a number, one or two numbers that are outside of, quote, normal, that's just a little bit outside because you could have been born that way. It could be something that you really can't do anything about. could be totally normal for you. And in trying to correct the number, you change other things about you that makes it where you're overall less healthy, okay? So kind of keep that in mind anytime you go through these labs. The goal is not necessarily to have all the numbers normal for, you know, like across the population as they apply to you, okay? Mm -hmm. And the reason why I bring that up first is because um, I was looking at your kidney function. So let's go down to the kidney function and creatinine. The creatinine, of when, if you are African American, if you are muscular, if you're male, your numbers will be higher than the cross-section of the population because that substance is what's, you know, created in muscles. So when muscles turn over as you build and lose muscle mass, and that happens normally, you know, like 
uh, you know, they say every seven years, every cell in your body has died and regenerated. Well, some cells regenerate a lot faster, like your, your, your skin, your hair, it turns over a lot faster, and some are slower, like your nerves, where it takes a long time for them to duplicate themselves, and some cells can't actually very well at all. Well, your muscle, they, they, they're, they're pretty rapidly turned over because we work them out, we lose them, we bump them, we bruise them. And so that number, if you have a lot of muscle mass, will be higher. So men typically have a higher muscle mass than women. If African Americans tend to have more than Caucasians or Asians. So that number for you is a tiny bit high, but you want to use that number in context with everything else, and your kidney function otherwise is completely normal. So like the BUN is also an indicator, and that number is really low. Mm -hmm. So when somebody goes into kidney failure, the BUN number is really high because that's the urea, the 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 me metabolic uh, process in your body. With, uh, those are like the byproducts, basically, the urine and the poop of your blood cells. Like, I'm trying to think of a mm -hmm. <laughs> like that. And basically, it's, it's circulating in your blood, and then when it gets to your kidneys, your kidneys filter all of that out, basically those waste out. And that's what the BUN is. So if your kidneys weren't doing their job, that number would be higher because it wouldn't be working to filter out those waste. So your number is nice and low. So it looks like you were pretty well hydrated and your kidneys are working. So I start off with that because that number is red, and I think that that probably is just going to be your baseline normal as long as you have the muscle mass, as long as you are exercising and active. As you get older, like become an older man, maybe in your 50s or 60s, that number will drop because your muscle, you decrease muscle mass unless you're a bodybuilder and you maintain that. But even then you're not going to be able to do the same later in life that you do now, probably, because most people, you know, they, they kind of go down as they get older. So that is that number. And then let's see, let's go back up, start at the top. Um, your cholesterol panel is actually pretty good, um, which is the first one on my screen, uh, cardiovascular health. It's pretty good. Your total cholesterol is fine. HDL is 52. They like it over 50. I mean, normal is over 40. They like it over 50. The HDL is the, the little, like, cholesterol particle, basically, that kind of go around in your blood, and they sweep up. They're like little vacuum cleaners, and they suck up all the extra cholesterol and, you know, get rid of, packages it up for your liver to get rid of. So that's why the HDL is a number that you want high, because and it just kind of goes overboard. And that's what the plaques are all about. So the reason why I mention that with cholesterol is because to demonstrate that just cholesterol, is not the problem. It's all this other stuff. So the reason why we test like, um, you know, the LDL and the, you had something of the ApoB, you know, we test those because those are, those tell us exactly what type of cholesterol is there, what stage of evolution is that cholesterol mo molecule. Is it more of a fat molecule? Is it more of a protein molecule? Because, you know, HDL, LDL, they all have different concentrations of fat in them versus cholesterol versus protein. It's different concentrations, and that's what makes it either more dense or less dense. But if you measure the, the ApoB, which is one of the ones that was uh, high on yours, it's one, cholest one, cholest one LDL or HDL or whatever, one-to-one, -one, it has this protein called an ApoB. Well, if it's an LDL, a VLDL, it has this ApoB, which is like um, it's a better measure of the amount of, the, the cholesterol you have in your, or the cholesterol molecules you have in your blood, because it doesn't matter the density of it because it's still one for one. So if you can kind of under, understand, if you measure just the cholesterol content, it, it doesn't tell you how many particles are there. You just know how much cholesterol, so you can have a very few particles with lots of cholesterol in them, and you don't know, do I have a lot of particles, or is it just a lot of cholesterol in a few particles? Whereas if you measure this... Um, marker basically it tells you how many particles and then together with the other number how much cholesterol it gives you a better picture of okay well i have a little bit of high cholesterol and i have a lot of particles as opposed to my particles i have a few particles but they have a lot of cholesterol and they're not really sure what the the treatment is the same i mean you know but they're uh these tests are really fine-tuned just so that you can kind of as you go through life say well when i was a younger guy i had 
a lot of particles. But then as I got older, I didn't have a lot of particles, and the composition of each particle was more fatty. So maybe I'll change my diet to a little bit less fried food as opposed to taking a, a statin, a medication. Mm-hmm. So I know that's all confusing, but if you follow that, that's why they do those two different measurements. And yours are both a little bit high. Um, again, the numbers themselves are, don't really matter as much as your diet and how you feel and what your constant baseline is. But And I'll, put, I'll write some recommendations on here so that you can go back to it and you don't have to take notes and you don't have to remember. But um, a few things that kind of help with cholesterol and the LDL, all of it works together is, of course, if you're overweight, you lose some weight. Of course, you don't smoke because that's inflammatory. So, um, you know, as you inhale and those particles are in your blood, that's a part of the inflammation cascade that makes cardiovascular disease hmm. um, so prevalent. It transforms a normal cholesterol floating around into this this inflammatory plaque, basically. So you okay. want to avoid, um, yeah. And, uh, of course, exercise, increased fiber, you know, niacin is, you know, B vitamin, which helps. Fish oil helps. And, again, I'll put these things in recommendations, and you can, um, you know, try. A lot of people, they like the fish oil because it's anti-inflammatory in general. So it doesn't just help with uh, this cholesterol issue. It helps with a lot of inflammatory processes. So some people have, like, arthritis because that's an inflammatory process or headaches or fatigue, things like that. And so the fish oil can help with those things if that the cause of it is this inflammation. So mm-hmm. I'll put that on your recommendation. Um, let me see if there's anything. Um, yeah, I've read that um, uh-huh. like fish oil specifically is, is good for, is it just like um, repairs? Like when you work out, you take fish oil and then it helps the body repair yeah. itself. Well, it, it 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 does indirectly. What it does is it stops the it's a kind of a more of an anti-inflammatory. So if you in our lives, there are so many things that cause inflammation. Um, uh, you know, pesticides on vegetables, our lotions and, and mm. deodorants, and you know what I mean. All those things can have um, chemicals in them that cause an infl- inflammatory process in your body. Mm. Well, exercise is also an inflammatory process. You know because as you run, as you lift weights, your body is under stress. And it's a good stress, you know, it helps circulate the blood or whatnot. But some people, they exercise too much, and it actually can be detrimental because you're causing a lot of inflammation and damage. So the thought is if you take fish oil, you're not necessarily so much, quote, healing your body any more than, say, resting or sleeping. You know, so it's kind of like if I told you, well, why don't you go to sleep early so that you can heal your body? Well, Mm -hmm. It is kind of healing your body, <laughs> but that you know what I mean. It's not like that would be necessarily the treatment for healing. You know, mm-hmm. it just it just happens to do that, and a whole bunch of other things too. So okay. that's what the fish oil does. It happens to do that, but I wouldn't take it for that. It mm-hmm. just kind of happens to do that because of the way it works in general with anti anti inflammation. Gotcha. Okay, and and a lot of the I mean, a lot of what we tell patients on this in this you know wellness FX is not necessarily the stuff that doctors have time to counsel patients on in their clinic appointments being rushed by insurance companies and whatnot. But a lot of even mainstream doctors are, like, advocating fish oil because it is it has very low risk if you don't have a bleeding disorder and you're not allergic to fish and things like that. And, you know, and there's a high potential for benefit. So it's just one of those things, one of those things that – you know, you if you don't you don't have any contraindications, meaning reasons not to take it, it's not a bad thing to take. Okay, and then let's see what else. And then um, see if there's any those extra lipid panel. Let me scroll down here. And so your estradiol level was a little bit elevated. You see that um, normal, like they don't want you to be over 42.7, and you're 44. So that's um, just very slightly above normal, but the reason why some that can go up, um, it you know, a lot of it, I think, has to do with our environment. Again, if you look at a lot of the lotions and parabens and things that are in lotions, so if you read the ingredients and in almost everything, unless you're specifically looking for natural, organic, you know, uh, products, mm-hmm. it has this methyl paraben or propyl paraben. And paraben, for one, I mean, there's a, like a, a hundred chemicals on the bottle, but those for sure have been proven to um, be hormone disruptors, meaning that they mimic estrogen. 
so in women, it's not as it's not as um, important as in men, but in women or young girls, they put all these creams and lotions on their hair and you know on their skin, and then like seven year old girls are developing breasts, they're starting their period when they're eight. <laughs> And really? this is not normal, right? This is not normal. And when they do, when they take tissue out of women's breasts and um, you know study the composition of the breast cancer uh, lump, they find a lot of these parabens and stuff in the tissue. Now, of course, the industry is saying, "Oh, that's just a coincidence." But a lot of people are kind of like, "Yeah, but this woman had breast cancer. You took out the tumor. You looked at the tumor and it has all the stuff in it that's in these products." So we can kind of deduce that it's probably contributing to the growth of these tumors and whatnot. And, you know, so that's going to be up for debate forever, just like big, big tobacco and big pharma and all these big lobbying industries um, pre- prevent sometimes the distribution of truthful information. You know, that's why you have to be smart and vigilant and look at the ingredients on these products. And so if it has this paraben and phthalates, you want to try to avoid them because it can mimic estrogen, and that might be some of what you see with the estradiol um, being a little bit higher. So that's a you know just just kind of changing your your hygiene products can maybe help to lower that. But also, if you're overweight, because uh, fat tissue makes estrogen, it, 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 that's what it does. And so people who tend to be overweight, they just make more of it because it's made in the fat tissue. Um, if you take any type of steroids not just uh, enhanced performance enhancing, but if you had asthma and you took steroids to breathe or if you had psoriasis, you know, steroids in general can cause an increase in estrogen. Some medications, if you drink a lot, um, I see you drink one or two drinks a day or a week or whatever it was, which didn't ring any bells with me, but um, if you drink, like you binge drink, you drink a six-pack a day or, you know, because men can safely drink about two to three drinks each day, and it's supposedly beneficial if it doesn't exceed that. Um, but if you drink more than that, then this can cause the estrogen to start to go up. And then, like I said, uh, um, age can cause a whole bunch of stuff to start to become, quote, abnormal. So as men get older, um, the testosterone t- drops some and the estrogen goes up some. So What if maybe uh, about binge drinking? What if it's like a binge drink that's like once a month and it is like, let's, let's go to the extreme and say it's like 10 beers in a day. Mm-hmm. Does that... I mean, is it like, can you average it out or does it matter? You know what I mean? Like, can it? Right. No, you're not supposed, it, it's better if it's not binge because the problem with binge drinking is that load of alcohol, it stresses your organs out. And I don't know that it would necessarily change your estrogen profile. I mean, I know that's our, that's in relation to our question, but in general, it doesn't because your liver is under a lot of stress trying to detoxify all of that alcohol. Because if you think about alcohol, it, we use it to kill bacteria. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a toxin. And the reason why we don't die is because our liver converts it from a toxin to something that's not toxic, you know. And so in, in sm- small moderations, what alcohol will do is it makes the liver work. Um, it keeps that system of detoxification up. So if you never use something, you lose it, right? So if your liver is used to detoxifying things, alcohol, whatever, then that that pathway of detoxification stays finely tuned, and that's why people, they can develop a tolerance because the liver kicks up that detoxification, like, cycle. So you drink a beer, you drink two, you haven't drank in a while, you feel it. Whereas if you drink, 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 and then you drink two beers after you've been drinking two beers for two weeks, then you don't feel it because the liver has kicked up its mechanism of detoxifying. So if you binge, the liver can't keep up, right? You know, so all of this alcohol is kind of, it's a toxin and it's kind of circulating so it can start to bother your stomach, it can cause ulcers, it can get into your bloodstream and cause heart palpitations and things like that. And when you're young, you can, you can tolerate it better because your, your organs are new. But as you get older, you'll realize that it's more difficult to recover. So your hangover is more severe, you know, you, you're still like it takes a day or two before you get back focusing at work, you know, it's just you can't party like you used to, basically, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, pretty much. And so that's what, you know, you feel it. And so those residual effects are your body telling you, I'm not as young as I used to be, you need to stop, basically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> basically. You know, you'll start to kind of forget things and you just won't be yourself, you know, after binging and it'll, be, it'll start to last longer and longer. So instead of getting up the next morning, going to class, it'll be a week later, and you'll still feel like, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm not going to be doing that anymore. You know, exactly. then your next 
exactly. So that to, it doesn't have anything to do with your estrogen, but in general, it is it is not as good to binge drink. It's better to just have your beer to each night, or don't have a beer to each night. And then when you go out and you want to feel tipsy, you know you don't have to drink so much. You know you just drink two beers as opposed to having to drink a six pack in order to get that same effect. Gotcha. Okay, let me see if there's anything else. I don't think. Uh, I don't know if it's on your end, but your phone's breaking up a little bit. Is it a cell phone? Uh, Are you on a cell phone by chance? I am not on the cell phone. I'm on the cordless. Uh, yeah, it's breaking up a little bit. Um, let me see. Let me walk in this area and see if it makes a difference. Am I breaking up to you? You are breaking up a little bit. You want me to, want me to try to call right back? I'll hang up. You hang up and call the number back. Okay. You said you wanted me to call you right back. Yes. Is that better? Yeah, it's better now. Okay, good. So, I, let me see. I think that that was it in terms of the abnormals. Let me go through one more time and look. Oh, I have one more question about oh. the um, estrogen. The uh, Sure. You said paraben. Is that how you say it? was in lotions? Yeah. So Parabens, like, uh-huh. Is it, is it spelled how it sounds, kind of? P-E-R? Uh, yeah, P-A-R-A-B-E-N. Got it. Right. And you'll see it, uh, you know, it might be parabens and might be methyl paraben, but if you go to places like in the natural um, part of Target, you know, natural products or, you know, Whole Foods or whatever, mm -hmm. a lot of the bottles will say no parabens on the bottle. So you don't have to look that hard because it's, it's a big thing now, um, uh, you know, yeah. Okay. So packaging reflects that. But even, okay, so now that that's kind of been uh, an established issue, is that more, it's more um, relevant to females, right? It is more relevant to females because male, um, males already have a lower level of estrogen anyway, obviously, because mm -hmm. they don't have the ovaries producing estrogen. Um, the reason why I bring it up, though, is because sometimes some men can start to experience um, fatigue or dizziness or impotence, you know, where they are, their loss of sex drive things like that because mm -hmm. they have too much estrogen. Your estrogen is not high enough where I would be concerned or I wouldn't be expecting for you to be experiencing any of that. Mm -hmm. But I have the conversation because if you change your products and you retest your levels, let's say, in six months and they're down, then you know exactly what the cause was. You had mm -hmm. this, you changed something, and now it's better. Whereas if they're higher or they didn't change, then you're, you're starting to think, well, could it be something else? I mean, am I drinking too much, or am I, do I weigh too much, or you know what I mean, like those sorts of things. Gotcha. So that's why I bring it up, just so that you can uh, watch it if, if you start to experience some of those symptoms of too much estrogen. Gotcha. And then, oh, and your, the only other thing, as I scroll down towards the bottom, is your, um, your white blood cell count. You know, it's, a, it's highlighted red, but the the we call that a part of the CBC, which is a complete blood count, which is the white cells and the red cells. And white blood cells are the cells that are like the little soldiers. They are surveillance for infection. And when you have an infection or an exposure to uh, a bug, basically, and we're exposed to bugs all the time, we just don't always get sick because our immune system kicks in and we don't even realize sometimes that it's fighting, um, the blood cells can go up or down. If they go, when they go up, it's usually like a bacterial infection. Um, you're usually a little bit sicker, um, you know, and you feel fatigued and, and whatnot. Not always, but a lot of the time. If you have a little virus, then your blood cells can either go up or down. And the lymphocytes, which is one of the cells here that, was it a little bit high? Let me see. No, it was actually normal, but your the other count was a little bit low. So... You have like lymphocytes, you have monocytes, you have um, neutrophils, which are all different kinds of white blood cells. And basically, it's, they're just little soldiers in different uniforms because they fight different types of bugs. And so with, with one number is higher or one number is lower, it's just because of what your body was exposed to. So like lymphocytes fight viruses better. Neutrophils fight bacteria better. So let's say you 
ate something and it had a lot of bacteria growing in it, like E. coli or something, and your body was fighting it, well, mm-hmm. your neutrophils would be higher. If you were exposed to the flu at work or a cold or a cough or bronchitis that was viral, your kids, whatever, then your lymphocytes would be a little bit higher because your body has recruited those type of soldiers to fight this type of bug. So those numbers change, like, you know, like weekly. Like, you know, I wouldn't stress about the composition of those unless the the neutrophils are super-duper low where you can't fight a bacterial infection. That's a sign of something wrong, and your number is not low, low enough to be concerned. And your white blood cell count is a tiny bit low, which could be mean that you were fighting some sort of, you know, some sort of viral infection. And it's hard to know if you were or weren't because it doesn't necessarily mean you were sick. You know, you may not have felt sick. You may have had a little headache. Maybe you were a little bit more tired. Maybe you just weren't as hungry. Like, you know, we go through all this just we don't even know what's wrong with us. Like, you know what I mean? Like, right. it's just one of those things. Like, today is just not a good day. I have a headache. I feel like I'm under stress. I'm not dealing with emotions very well or whatever. And you don't even really know why. And it could just be because you were fighting a virus or something. And the blood tests reflect that. But you can't remember what you were feeling on January, whatever, when you got your blood drawn. So gotcha. those are, those, that's something that we just watch for, too, and we just repeat it. Again, if the numbers are really high, normal's up to about 10, 11, so let's say you were 25, then that would be a problem. You know, we're like, well, why, why, what's going on? And if the numbers were really low where it looks like you couldn't um, mount an infection if you got, ex- I mean, an immune response if you got an infection, that would be a problem. So yours is 3.8, so if it were like 1.2. You're like, well, wow, you don't have any bl- white blood cells. If you get exposed to a, a flu or something, you're going to be out of it. Then we start thinking about, well, why? Could that be a bone marrow issue with some sorts of some sorts of cancers can cause those numbers to be really high or really low, or like HIV and things like that can cause the numbers to be really low, but your numbers are not high enough or low enough to be impressive. But those are just some of the things that if you – Google white blood cells or you know whatever that will come up, and it's just your number is not impressive enough to be concerned about those things based on this number. Mm-hmm. Okay, and let's see if there's anything. And those are all the abnormal labs. Oh, your vitamin D is a little low, 25, and they want it to be over 30. And in the winter, it's common to have low vitamin D because you're not in the sun as much. If you have darker skin, it's common because the darker skin blocks out the rays better, so it doesn't get inside to create this vitamin D. So you just take a supplement. Um, they have lots, and I can put that on your recommendations too. They have lots of supplements over the counter that you take mm-hmm. for vitamin D, and there's really no science to it. You just kind of take it, and then you test the blood again and see if your num- numbers are better. If they're not, you increase the dose. If they are, if they're too high, you lower the dose, and that's how you go. And when the sun starts to come out more. If you do some more outside work, you won't need as much of the supplement. So, so is that that's uh, how that works. The vitamin D is it is it absorbed through the ultraviolet light? It is, and so what happens is your your skin cells absorb the light and it converts it to a substance that's needed. It, it's complicated, but basically it creates this substance where the vitamin D, the precursor, can be converted to the active form. So it's just like this. It, it, it's needed to, like, cook it, basically. I'm trying to think of how to, like, if you cook it, so you have this raw stuff inside of your body, but it needs to be converted yeah. to, yeah, and that's what the uh, radiation does, the UV radiation does that. So then the excess is the skin cancer, right? The um, excess of, uh, I mean, the UV radiation, you said skin cancer? Yeah. yeah, it can, you know, skin cancer is, not as common as the vitamin D deficiency. Um, and so we, as Americans, and maybe humans, tend to kind of go overboard, it's one thing or another, you know. And so um, now it's like, or it has been this whole uh, skin cancer scare, which is not to, not, you know, I mean, that, that's significant. But with, without vitamin D, you have brittle bones. And, you know, and I see a lot of children, particularly with broken bones, partly because they do repetitive sports, you know, more competitive at earlier ages, so that Mm -hmm. contributes, but also, too, because their bones are weaker. You know, the the calcium is not being able to be used appropriately in their bones. Maybe they're not eating the right foods. It's too inflammatory. And they're not getting enough sunshine because they're playing indoors or, you know, in school day, whatever the issues may be. So 
you know, they're, they're trying to start a campaign of get your kids outside and back in the sun and stop putting a whole bunch of sunblock on them. Hmm. But, you know, when people, if, if somebody gets skin cancer, of course it makes news, but the vitamin D deficiency in the broken bones, you know, are not as are not as sexy. So you don't hear as much <laughs> about don't. it, but, you know, so, yeah. but I wouldn't worry as much about that. I mean, you just be smart. You know, if you burn easily, you'll need a little bit, you know, you'll need some sunblock and you'll need to protect yourself from the sun. But if you tan, you know, or you have darker skin, you don't have to worry about it as much. And of course, brown people do get skin cancer, but it's rare. And, you know, it's much more common to have these other things that are going on, like I said, vitamin D deficiency and weak bones and osteoporosis and all of that, as opposed to skin cancer. So just kind of keep it all in perspective. And melanoma is the one that people are most concerned about. And a lot of melanoma happens on parts of the body that are not even exposed to the sun. You know, so there's more to it than just sun exposure for the deadliest kind of skin cancer. You know, and the ones that are not deadly, like your squamous cell, which is the superficial top part of your skin, or the basal cell, like a lot of older white men will have it on their nose, farmers and things like that. Those are not, they don't, they're not deadly. You just cut them out and you're cured. So, you know, it's, it's not, I don't want to say it's not a big deal because it, it is, especially if you have it, <laughs> it's a huge deal. But I wouldn't be overly concerned about it because it's not as common as you might think it is listening to the news. Gotcha. Okay, so any other questions or? Yeah, I didn't know vitamin Did D was, uh, vitamin D is, uh, contributes to strong bones. I didn't know that. So that vitamin D in addition yeah. to calcium? Yeah, they kind of work together. And the calcium is complicated, too, because a lot of people, a lot of the thought, I shouldn't say a lot, a lot of the thought is if you take calcium supplements, then the calcium gets to where it's supposed to be. And studies are kind of showing that that may not necessarily be the case. So people were drinking lots of milk, and the calcium wasn't going into the bones, and they were still getting osteoporosis. So now they know there's more to it. There's a hormone component to it, you know, like the vitamin D component to it. There's is more complicated than just taking a, a pill. And if you think about a lot of what we do, it is more complicated. I mean, if you eat, um, if you take a multivitamin to get your your nutrients, it's not like getting the food. I mean, there's nothing that humans yet can do to duplicate all of the the little nuances that are in a plant so that if you eat the plant, you're getting all of the good stuff. Whereas mm -hmm. if you take a vitamin of the plant, you know, you might get your vitamin D or your vitamin whatever, but the plant probably has a lot of vitamins and stuff in it that we haven't even discovered, you know. So it's not the same because we're not as a race or a species as smart as we like to think we are, and we can't just duplicate all of God's work in a pill. So mm -hmm. that's why a lot of the pills that we take um, don't necessarily solve the problem. They just deal with one aspect of the problem, and that's part of it with the sunshine. I mean, the sun, I mean, we know that the UV radiation and the vitamin D, but, you know, maybe there's other stuff in the sun that we need to live that we just don't know about, and you just can't take a vitamin D tablet and replace what the sun provides for you, you know, and, and if you think about, like, um, people who can't sleep, well, a lot of times people can't sleep because maybe they didn't go outside, so their body doesn't know, their body, their mind doesn't know. It's sunny now, it's dark now, whereas 100 years ago, it was, you know, dark was dark, and, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you put out the fire and dark was dark, so you right. didn't have some of the problems that we have now. So it's, and I say all that to say that there's not always a cut and dry. We don't know, you know, you, you we don't know all of the different things. We don't know all the different things that vitamin D does, but obviously things are lacking. And what I do notice is I do notice that people in general, and you probably do too, are just, they're sicker and they don't feel well, and the doctors don't know why, and everybody's on more and more medications, but they're not feeling better because they're not doing the common sense things like looking at maybe what they rub onto their bodies or mm -hmm. what, you know, what they brush their teeth with. Is it toxic? Is it like, you know, what what's in toothpaste? I mean, you know what I mean? Like, what is yeah. this stuff? Like, what does it do? Has it been studied? Like, do I really want to put this in my mouth two or three times a day every day for my whole life and think I'm going to be okay, <laughs> okay right. with that? You know, so you want to start thinking about those things. And as you get older, it becomes more important because your body is not as able to recover and just ignore a lot of things that we were able to used to do when we were in college age or high school. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. All 
righty. So any other questions? I mean, we still have some time, but if you're you're good, we can go. <laughs> um, well, I guess the main thing is, I know you said you were going to add things to the notes or the, the rec, mm -hmm. what was it called, at the bottom? Yeah, the recommendations. Yeah. I was going to add, um, you know, some fish oil. Um, let's see, what else did we talk about? And some di the diet, the things that we talked about in terms of things that might can decrease the estrogen level. Um, just notes, just information, that, that sort of information. Uh, let's see if there was something else. And um, about the cholesterol issues, I can add a, a thing about niacin. Now, keep in mind, you don't have to do the recommendations, and when you talk to other members of the team, they may know more about, like, let's say, what sorts of foods have niacin in them, let's say. And you may be like, well, instead of taking this niacin tablet, I'd rather just eat beans or whatever because it has niacin in it and see how that works. And that's perfectly fine, too. That's why it's a whole team. Um, and you'll talk to, or if you haven't already, talk to a dietitian and, you know, whoever else exercise gotcha. fitness person yeah gotcha. yeah um well yeah i guess that that answers my questions then because i, I basically i want to at least shoot to na like naturally cure mm -hmm. these deficiencies through diet and exercise mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. what can't be i would supplement right exactly and i would recommend that too because anything that you take um, especially medications will have side effects. And so your cholesterol panel and all that is not bad enough where I would say that you couldn't take care of it with just modifications in your diet, um, you know, like if you like eating better foods. I know you said you don't eat processed foods, but one thing that I propo uh, propose is cutting back on like sugars, you know, so your carbs. So like mm -hmm. white sugars, if you, if you add anything to like sodas, cut those out. Or, or limit them, you know, um, because those are not really as good as as people like to think they are. Even diet is, is worse than regular because the sweetener in diet sometimes is not something your body is even familiar processing, whereas at least sugar, your body knows what to do with that. So it's probably mm -hmm. better just to eat sugar than the aspartamine or whatever. Um, you know, when you sweeten things, you sweeten it with honey because honey has nutrients in it and it has anti-inflammatory and helps with allergies and that sort of thing. So if you're going to do sweeteners, you know, you use honey. Um, the paleo diet, a lot of people are doing a modified paleo, which I think seems to help a lot of patients. It helps manage weight. It helps with hunger. So if you eat more proteins and less carbs, you're not as hungry. I understand if you work out and you're about to exercise or run or whatever, you need some carbs for that instant energy for your muscle cells to use to get you through the, the exercise regimen. But if, you, if it's just if you're going to work, it's a regular day, if you start off your day with, like, eggs and bacon and limit the oatmeal, limit the toast or whatever, you'll find that you're not hungry until well after lunchtime, you know. So mm -hmm. one or two, you're hungry, and then you can eat a little something, whatever, chicken salad or whatever that doesn't have a lot of carbs. And then dinner, you know, you, you'll just find that you can eat three meals a day or two meals a day, and you just feel satisfied and you don't feel hungry. You don't have this up-and-down blood sugar and it decreases the inflammation. So a lot of the problems that people have been having that are vague, like skin rashes, little aches and pains in their joints, um, it tends to get a lot better because they're not going through the spike in sugar up and down, up and down, up and down, even mm -hmm. without diabetes. Your your numbers for diabetes look perfect. Like you, you're not close to being a diabetic or anything like that. But mm -hmm. you still have insulin where when you eat some carbs, the only way your body can process that is by releasing insulin. And the more insulin you release, the more frequently you release it, the faster it has to come out, your body eventually gets immune to it, right? So it's like if you're a, a muscle cell and, you know, you there's sugar in the blood and, there's, and your body doesn't like sugar in the blood. It just hates it. So it, it squirts out insulin. And what insulin does is it makes the muscle cell, all the cells, so I'm using muscle as an example, it makes them open up and take that sugar in. And so, you know, in that way, the blood sugar, the, the sugar in the blood, the blood sugar goes down because now the sugar has been moved out of the blood 
into the muscle cell. So now the sugar is normal. Well, if you if insulin keeps getting squirted out of your pancreas, your pancreas gets tired, first of all, but then the muscle cell starts to say, all right, all right, it's like somebody knocking at your door. Eventually, you can just ignore it. Like, I don't even hear it anymore. And so your muscle cell stops hearing the insulin. It stops sensing it. It, it develops an immunity to it. Like, okay, all right, you're always bothering me. And so the insulin doesn't work. So even if it's there, the sugar doesn't get inside the muscle because the muscle will open its door because it doesn't hear the, the insulin, you know, knocking. Mm-hmm. And so you want to make sure your tissue stays sensitive to, to insulin so that when the insulin circulates and knocks on the door, the door opens so the sugar can go in. And the gotcha. way you do that is to not abuse the insulin. And in, in our society, with all the carbs that we eat, you know, the low-fat, high-carb diet, basically the vegetarian diets that are – because vegetables have sugar. They're vegetable sugars, but they're still sugar. And mm-hmm. that's the primary source of your nutrition. Then you can see how it's easier to – develop this insulin resistance, and insulin resistance is what leads to diabetes, it leads to hypertension, cholesterol issues, and ultimately stroke and heart attacks, because the insulin is a, it plays a bigger role in all of this than I think that people recognize. Gotcha. So, yeah, so basically eat more protein. I'm not saying don't eat any carbs, but eat more protein, focus on that. Do some reading about the paleo diet and see if it's something that sounds like you, something you'd enjoy <laughs> if you like chicken and beef and, you know, bacon and things like that, you'll probably enjoy it. And it's hard to follow the diet 100% in our in our world um, because we're not, it's just like a caveman diet and we're not cavemen. So, you know, we can't eat like they did. But you can take some of the pearls that come with the diet and apply it to your diet. And I think that you will realize that you feel better just because you're not hungry and it's not always about food and energy because that's stable. Gotcha. Yeah. I guess uh, okay. I've been reluctant about diets, not necessarily diet to lose weight. I guess that's the typical um, interpretation of diet, but I've been reluctant to follow the latest trend because it seems like there's always new ones coming out. So I've heard a lot about the paleo diet. I just haven't mm-hmm. really looked into mm-hmm. it. You know, my mom's. Well, don't, a- I mean, and then like, like any diet, like, you know, that you follow, if it's a valid, quote, diet, you don't want to look at it as a diet, as more like a like a lifestyle, you know, that you, can, that you can stick to. So that's why I said look at it, and if it's something where you like, if you eat eggs and bacon, let's say, and you eat chicken and beef and you like it, then mm-hmm. it's kind of easy to stick to because it, it, you like that stuff, you know. And if, you, if it means just cutting out, like you already cut out processed foods or you try to in fast food, so basically you're making your own food, it sounds like, if you're not eating fast food or you're mm-hmm. going to nicer restaurants where, you know, it's not fast food. And there's a lot of options. So instead of getting, you know, the, the French fries, you get sweet potato fries. So that's if you like that, you know what I mean? So that's right. a small switch. Or if you do get French fries, instead of eating all the fries, you eat three or four of them just to go with your burger. And mm-hmm. maybe you get a lettuce wrap instead of a – the bun or if you eat a bun for dinner maybe the next morning you don't eat the bagel like you know what i mean it's just kind of that sort of little small you know just kind of thinking about what you put in your body and whatever diet or not diet you're on you always want to think about what am i putting in my body because you know that's how that's what your body uses to repair itself and build and grow and stay healthy and fight so you always want to think about that anyway mm-hmm. so you know that's that's the only that so don't don't look at anything you're doing as a temporary weight loss diet or whatever. Just kind of look at like a general like I need to eat more protein, so let me not eat as much sugar in general. And that's just that's culture diet. You know, okay. I'm just gonna eat more protein. You yeah. know what I mean? All right, one last question. You did say you mentioned uh-huh. I, I have a like a almost a sugar addiction. Like I added to my cereal mm-hmm. all the time and tea and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. You did mention honey. Can you explain again? Mm-hmm. Like you said, I think how I interpret it now is that the if I add honey as a sweetener instead of sugar, there's natural health benefits to honey versus sugar. Mm-hmm. And then um, mm-hmm. you said it'll also, uh, I guess, benefit me cholesterol wise, right? Or was mm-hmm. that were you talking well, about the, insulin or something like that? Right. And so the sugar is better than aspartamine or that other stuff that they make in a lab. Okay. Yeah. So if you're gonna 
if you had to choose between those, choose sugar. But sugar is inflammatory. And so if you have cholesterol issues, which you kind of on the borderline do, and you eat sugar and refined foods, like refined rice, refined flour, then it's going to cause a little bit of a inflammation. And in the setting of your cholesterol, it contributes to the plaque development. So that's, that's how that kind of ties together. Honey, the reason why I say that that's better is because unlike sugar, which has no nutritional value, you know, it provides energy and that's it. And sometimes you need that. So I'm not saying don't ever eat it. But honey also provides energy because it's sweet. It has a lot of carbs. But it also has, because the bees make it, it comes from nature, the, it, it helps with allergies. Uh, it's not like an alternative treatment for allergies that are, and, and things in your environment. So if you eat honey, local honey, the things like the pollens, the trees, and all that stuff that's in your environment, the bees kind of um, pr produce a honey, like a serum basically, right, this golden serum that's kind of a mix of all of everything that's in the trees and the air and all that, and then you eat it, it's like your immune system now realizes this is what's in my environment, and it knows how to deal with it. It recognizes it as being something that shouldn't, it shouldn't be afraid of. So that's one big benefit of honey. Two, it doesn't increase your blood sugar quite as um, quickly as regular sugar. It requires a little bit of a breakdown. And any time you eat anything sweet, whether it's a carrot that's kind of sweet, orange juice or whatever, the more your body has to do to break it down into sugar, the slower your blood sugar will go up and the, the less insulin has to be squirted out, mm -hmm. you know, cause the ins so it can come out more slowly as opposed to spiking. So honey does have a spike. I'm not going to try to make it sound like it's like a wonder drug or, you know, but it come, it, the, the spike is lower because your body has to do a few things before it's just simple sugar, whereas sugar is sugar, and it can be absorbed through your stomach, basically, through your almost, I don't know if it can be through your mouth, but almost, you know, like when you have diabetics and they're in a diabetic coma, you can put some sugar in their mouth or whatever, and it starts to absorb, you know, I don't know if it's exactly absorbing through their mouth, honestly, but it absorbs really quickly through the mucosa, meaning that somewhere between the mouth and the stomach, it comes out, whereas things like carrots have to be broken down, and that's, that's sweet, too. So mm -hmm. if you're going to add sugars, you know, it's better to, or sweet things, it's better to add honey given the choice. So things like coffee, if you like the taste of honey, um, co you can add it in coffee, you can add it in tea. It's really good in tea, of course. And you can mix it around and, try, you know, test it on your, on your cereals and things like that. But, you know, also other things for your cereals to consider is if you cut up fruits and things, you mm -hmm. know, like f sweet strawberries and things like that, that might satisfy your sweet tooth. You know, just as well as sugar, especially after a while, because when you stop eating the sugar, you'll feel like, oh, I, I'm missing it, I'm missing it. But then after a week or two, you'll stop craving it as much, just like anything that you drink or eat a lot or anything you do a lot. You know, after a while, you'll start, you'll, your, your craving will diminish. Like people who smoke, you know, the cravings are really high at first, but then after five years, let's say, mm -hmm. you know, they might can now be around a cigarette and not smoke or an alcoholic. Whereas that initial transition is the hardest. So if you're able to kind of cut back on the sugar, you'll, you'll, you'll feel better. And long term, because you have a family history of these things, it's in your genes that you could develop these things. And so you want to be aware of that. And if you're not making a decision now to cut back, because you're, you know, your attitude might be, and I would understand, I'm not diabetic now, so I may, I may as well enjoy what I can now because if I'm going to be a diabetic when I'm 40 and I can't have cake anymore, I may as well enjoy it now. Mm -hmm. And I get the logic, and, I, you know, that, that's true, but there might be a way you can prevent diabetes if you cut back now and you may never have to experience where you can't have cake ever because you're diabetic, you know? Gotcha. Makes sense. All righty. All right. I appreciate it. All right. Well, absolutely. And so I would say get your lab tested again in about six months. You know, a year is fine because you're a young, healthy guy. Your labs look great. Um, and you can compare and you could do it yearly or, you know, every 18 months or two years, whatever you feel like you want to do. But I think that this is your, you've got a, you're at a good age for a good baseline. So okay. that's good. All right. All righty. Well, it was nice talking to you. Yeah, likewise. Um, thanks okay. a lot. Okay. Well